So you can go in and solve problems. And that's the goal. So, you know, maybe it's a landscape photo and you realize a problem there. Well, you know, what typically happens is you finish your editing and you think you're done and then you give it a look and you realize, oh, wow, I missed something, <laughs> the tripod leg. Well, now the erase tool is non-destructive as is clone and stamp. So if you realize you need to erase something, it doesn't need to create a new layer. You could just click erase, adjust the size of your brush and paint over anything you don't want in that shot. Maybe I want to get rid of the tripod leg there. It's going to clean that up. Or I see a little bit of over vignetting in the corner caused by the lens. And I could just take that out. And again, with a click, it's going to remove that. And so it's super easy and it analyzes the surrounding pixels. But it didn't need to create a new layer. And it does that content aware erase that's very quick. And you could continue to edit the image or make adjustments. If you realize you missed anything else, just touch it up and continue to work. And all of that is stored in your history. So that works really well. And, you know, most of you have seen our sky replacement technology, but in case you have it, it's very easy to choose a new sky. We always suggest loading your own. And remember, you can now add them into the folder. This area will continue to get refined with additional content. We're also working on reflections coming next year. But notice how easy it is to swap that out and apply the lighting of that to the scene. So if I go to something that's warmer, the scene is going to become warmer. And so it's very simple. And don't be shy with those advanced settings. That's where you can adjust haze and adjust the color temperature of the sky so it better matches the mood that you're going for. So lots of flexibility there. Uh, there were some other questions. Do the tools interact? Yes, everything is live. So if I start to layer in some atmosphere here and I change that type, what you're gonna see is we can adjust the depth and it moves forward along the Z axis there, wrapping around the rocks and being able to add the haze in for the morning. So you can adjust where that comes. If you wanna adjust the colors of that, take advantage over here of your color harmony. And this is where the wonderful split color warmth is. So I can go after the warm areas and just warm them and control those separately, as well as the cold areas independently, making it really easy to dial that in and get the tone that you want. So I hope that makes sense. I wanna get out of the way for uh, Nicole and Jim, but uh, let me just take a really quick look at the Q&A here and make sure I answered some of those. Oh, is there a histogram? Absolutely, you can bring up the histogram and you still have clipping. So maybe Nicole or Jim, you can open up your histogram there. Uh, there are edit masks on almost all of the tools just like before, so you still have that. Um, after you receive Luminar AI, is there a need for Luminar 4? You can keep both installed on your system. Your catalog will not migrate from Luminar 4 to Luminar AI. The under the hood engine has been totally redone uh, with a new AI engine. So those edits don't translate and your catalog won't translate. So if you still have Luminar 4 and you have stuff, you may wanna leave that there if it uh, matters to you, but it's not a big deal. Um, we talked about the tools interacting, so that's good. Um, as far as the color tone with the atmosphere effects, hopefully that split color warmth works for you there, Chris. Um, we'll show you the guys the histogram in a moment. And uh, we will talk about a couple other things, but I think that covered most of the questions and I'll try to go through and answer a few more, but Frederick, let me toss back to you and maybe Jim and Nicole each have a quick photo they can share. That'd be great. Rich, before we transition to that, just a, the I think one of the one of the really powerful parts of this software that I've seen in these demos is the the template feature which you demoed. Can you just talk briefly about that a little bit and 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 hammer home that it's not the the templates aren't just sort of dumb presets that move sliders. They're a little bit they're they're much smarter than that. Can you talk about how they're architected and how people can expect to see them work? Sure, sure. So very quickly, and also one question, someone was commenting about speed. We're using a beta here, guys. One of the things that's done in the last month before release is connecting all of the pieces and speeding it up. So when software is developed, it's developed in pieces. Different people work on different pieces. And so now all those pieces are being integrated together and bugs and speed are what we focus on for the last few weeks before shipping. So uh, what you're seeing here is close to feature lock, but speed and performance is still being refined. All right, so let's go here to templates really quick. 
And uh, I'm going to go up. Actually, let me switch in the catalog. Um, so you can change to different folders. And depending upon the image that you select, the template is going to change. So let's go back here to the regular one at the top level and the for this photo section. Uh, this is where it's going to make a suggestion. So as I change images, it may change, as you see there, it detected that this was a traditional landscape. So it suggested the easy landscape category. Uh, some of the finessing here, this one, it detected that there was possible sunset time. Now you can freely choose what you want, but it's going to suggest based upon the content. Now, sometimes the suggestions are gonna completely resonate with you. Other times it's gonna seem strange. So for example, uh, let me go in here to the home and there was a photo that uh, I found humorous, its suggestion, but it was actually totally on uh, with its suggestion. So let's go here to some piles of feathers. Here we go. And in the templates, uh, it was being fine-tuned. It suggested both objects and nature. Objects because of all the close-up macro work here on the feathers and nature because it identified correctly that there was a bunch of feathers and that this might be a wildlife shot. So in this case, the exploded pillows from the pillow fight suggested different images. And as you switch, it's gonna scan and suggest. And so you are free to use these. Almost all of these have AI tools built in. So they will intelligently adapt to the image that you use. And with that single slider, as you choose something, it's very simple to dial it in. So if you feel like it's too strong, but you like the direction it was going, you can just dial it in with a single slider very quickly. You can sync that, you can copy and paste it, or like the word applies, template, click edit so you can customize it. And that's where you can go in and work. For those of you that were asking about layers, we're finalizing our local masking tool. It's not done yet, but there is the ability to load in textures there. So you can use other images and layer those in. Uh, you also, of course, when you're doing things can handle that. People also asked about lens correction. It's absolutely built in. You could apply that auto distortion correction to remove any lens correction. And there you see it applied and removed some of that. Additionally, don't underestimate the ability to fix things like your verticals. You'll be surprised how there's verticals that you didn't notice that might need correcting. And so windows can be straightened, things can be leveled, uh, and you can go through and quickly suggest a new crop and it's gonna analyze the image and make those suggestions. And when you realize at any point in time, there's something you wanted to remove or fix, what you're gonna notice is that the tools are smarter. So for example, if I go into clone and stamp, it's gonna remove everything. So now I'm free to go back to the original image. It didn't permanently remove it, but I can select my source point here and then clone out, you know, this unwanted um, thing that was right there. You know, let me just take this out here. And so I had a little bit of an unwanted area. You can use that or you can use the erase tool and you can blend those in, there we go. And then when you release that, what it's gonna be able to do is blend it. So you could adjust that the softness, et cetera. Let me go ahead and clear that out. The point being, not a good live demo there as I was rushing. But what I want you to see is that when you leave that tool, it then reapplies everything else on top of the clone stamp. So the style, the edits, everything you did goes back to life. Same thing if I went into the erase tool, it's non-destructive. So if I had an area there that I needed to clean up or wanted to remove, I could do that. And then when I apply it, all of the other edits are gonna be applied on top of that. And it will then reconnect everything and rewire it. So I hope that makes sense. That was perfect. That was perfect. Thanks Thanks for hammering that home, Rich. Um, we've got we've got a couple minutes left. Let's, let's use some of that time for a quick demo from Nicole and Jim. Nicole, you wanna you wanna go first? Sure. Let me jump over to sharing here. All right. So um real quickly I know that there was a question about histograms and it's right up here in the top right. Um, if you want to see it, just go to view and show histogram that we'll toggle that off and on. And um, so I know I'm kind of, you know, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to try to get through this pretty quickly while still trying to pass along some information. But you'll see, oh, actually, I did want to jump over to something before that. Someone else asked about 
uh, oops, not wrong thing, sorry. Um, someone asked about this, the actual computer I was using. I'm on a Mac. I'm actually using a really old <laughs> Mac for this. Um, I have a sound booth and this is where the computer I currently have in my sound booth. I'll probably be updating it in a few months, but it hasn't really been causing me problems. Um, but just so you know, you know, this is like an eight year old computer that I'm working on. And so, you know, you've seen how things are working. So just kind of keep that in mind. So uh, this is a portrait of my niece, Lily, and I'm gonna start out by going over to that portrait tab, jump over to face AI, and uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is just add some face light. Now, one of the things that I thought was really cool about editing this portrait in particular is that her eyes are not really visible. Like, you know, they're kind of, she's kind of got her eyes closed so you can't see the irises, but Luminar still knows that this is a face, you know, it's still able to do all of those things. So uh, for example, I can uh, remove the dark circles underneath her eyes. There we go. It's really subtle. I hope you guys can see it. I'll kind of go back and forth so you can see that uh, adjustment back off just a little bit. So it's a little bit more clear. Um, I could make, you know, I was usually kind of go down the, the lips um, just like and just kind of pop, 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 you know, about like between 15 and 20 setting there just to make a, a little bit more uh, red and saturated. Uh, let's see. Maybe even enlarge the eyes slightly. Let's see if that works. Um, it might not be doing much because her irises are not visible for that. Uh, I'll, I'll go down to skin, increase that uh, skin kind of smoothing. It's not really the best word because it still keeps a lot of the details there. That's one of the things that's nice about it. Um, there may be a touch of shine. So I usually like to just kind of increase that just for good measure. And then I can uh, click that skin defects removal to see if that, you know, finds any of those little blemishes. Now she's very young, so it's probably not much there. But just a quick before and after of only that face setting, and you can see how much that really has improved the photo. I was using a one light, very simple one light setup here. I just had it on a gray wall. Uh, so, you know, there was a lot of things happening. I didn't have any specific light going to her face. So this did a really good job of really helping that. Um, and now I'll just go back over to the essentials tab, jump into enhance, add some accent AI, it kind of fills in those shadows. I'm um, also going to go down to that color cast and just see about that. There's a tiny bit of a color cast. It's kind of a magenta look to it. Um, so by by increasing that color, remove color cast slider, that did help a little bit. But I could also go back into that light setting and maybe take that tint and pop it to the left just a touch to really fine tune that color correction. And I really I like I like this photo. There's a kind of a, it's a really good. Um, kind of a good uh, canvas for uh, really adding stylization. So I'm gonna jump over to the creative tab, go into mood, and I'm gonna choose, well, I gotta, sometimes I have to toggle it a few times because of the beta. Um, I'm gonna add a LUT here, and it's neat, you can just kind of scroll over them and see how they change. And I'm gonna go with this involve LUT and just kind of play around with the settings, maybe increase the contrast, reduce the saturation a bit, and it also is, I, I like to add matte effects sometimes to, uh, it's kind of a trendy, you know, it's kind of a trendy look, but I think it looks really good with portraits. So maybe add a touch of that matte setting. And let me go do a quick before and after of everything I've done so far, you know, and I'm really kind of doing this pretty quickly. I've, I think I've only been editing for two or three minutes uh, while talking and kind of like what Jim was saying, you know, if we'd done this without talking, this would have been, <laughs> our edits would be a lot faster. Um, and another thing you can do is if you get to where you feel like you're finished, but maybe it's a little heavy handed overall, uh, because what I like to do, and the same thing with what Jim's edits were, I like to add a lot of little subtle adjustments that really build up the effect. And, in the end, you get this really dramatic change. But sometimes while you're doing it, you might no not notice how much you've made you know, changes to it. So you can go down to what is like, if I were to save this as a template, I could save it down here. But this is also what in Luminar 4, if you're familiar with uh, that program, there was an adjustments amount slider in the layers panel. And if you take that slider, this is the same thing, take that slider and just drop it to the left, that's going to reduce every single edit in your, uh, you know, on in Luminar for this photo and just drop it down with, you know, for, so this is probably about 75% or so. It still made a really great uh, dramatic impact and change, but it's, you know, it's a little bit more subdued. So yeah, so there's my kind of like speed edit. <laughs> um, cool. And yeah. All right, well, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Sure. 
Um, let's, Jim, you got a speed edit for us? <laughs> yeah, I sure do. I will do my best. Let me, uh, let me get into Luminar. Can you see this photo? Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, like, uh, like Nicole, I have a portrait this time as well. I, I like to joke. I've never really historically done a lot of portrait work. I like to joke that Luminar has done the impossible, which is make me interested in uh, taking and editing portraits. Um, but it really has. So, uh, this is a photo, by the way, I did not take, I got this from Unsplash. But um, again, I'm loving the templates because they're giving me ideas. And one of the things I like a lot in the portrait tab, uh, it does suggest uh, different categories, but if you scroll down, you can get into one called experimental. And I really like this one because it has a lot of light leaks. So I'm gonna use this cold frame and it kind of sticks a light leak on there and you can see it changes the tones overall. So I'm pretty happy with that as my base image, but there's a couple things I wanna do. So I'm gonna make this kind of quick. Uh, I'm gonna start in light and you can see what they've already done, but I'm gonna reverse some of their changes. I'm going to actually add some contrast instead of they had it removed and I'm going to pull down the highlights the opposite of where they had them because I felt like it was a little bit uh, too bright for me in certain areas. And so I'm kind of going for a little bit of a dreamy kind of, uh, I don't know, creative portrait maybe. Um, the rest of what they applied I think looks fine. I'm going to get over here and go to toning. And once again, uh, with split toning, I just kind of want to get the highlights to be a little bit bluer actually so let me get this over here kind of in the blue range something about like that and then the saturation amount i'm gonna go to like you know 42 something like that so if i turn this off you can see that i'm basically what i'm trying to do is adjust some of that background color to reduce that pink because i just like it to be a little bit softer and messing with the highlights in the toning tool has helped me to do that then everybody's favorite mystical um and, and I've had a few questions on some of my videos. Hey, is Mystical still there? And as you can see, it is. Um, so there's that. Uh, now I'm going to pop over to Portrait and do a couple of quick things. I think the face is fine. I mean, this is obviously like a professionally shot image. The thing I'm really loving about portraits is the ability to change the eye color because that's something that you always had to do with like, um, uh, like color shifting and masking and all that before. So now I just come down and I've I've discovered that apparently I really like blue eyes because I keep using that same one on all these uh, photos that I'm editing, but I think it looks good and it kind of ties together, I think, with me softening that pink color and giving a little bit more blue in the background with the highlights. And so I'm going to do that, but I'm going to pull this down to about 40. I don't want to overdo it. I don't want it to look like, you know, boom, you know, she's got blue eyes, but I think it pulls together that image and that background color with her eyes a little bit, which I like. I'm going to go to Pro and go to Super Contrast, which used to be called Advanced Contrast. And in the shadows, I'm going to go to about 30. And when I turn that on and off, you can kind of see what it does. If you look at the before, you can see it's a little bit darker um, on the right-hand side. And using that Shadows Contrast, and that tool has lightened that a little bit. I wanted to keep the shadow, but I wanted to lighten it a little bit. And I think that was an easy way to do it. So it gives you a lot of control. This tool I recommend experimenting with if you haven't used it before. And then um, if I'm ever going to add a vignette, that's usually the last thing that I do. So I'm going to go over here, here and stick a vignette on real quick. I'm going to do about a negative 50 and a size of about 25 or so. And it defaults to centering in the image, which is where her face is. And that's where I want it, so I don't even need to place center. Um, I'm going to take the roundness down a little bit, maybe about 30. And then in feathering, I like to go... Uh, pretty high usually as well to soften that, that kind of gradient zone where the edge of the vignette begins and where the vignette gets heavy. So the vignette, it's subtle, but there's the before and there's the after. And that's really the whole thing. I'm just pointing out that templates, I think, are working really well for me, especially with portraits. And I'm especially excited about a number of these templates that include light leaks like this one, because it's given me some different ideas and kind of fun things that you can do with portraits. Because not being a portrait editor, I'm kind of looking for creative and interesting and different things to do as opposed to just traditional portrait editing. So it's been a lot of fun for me. But if you look at the before, you can see that's how the, the photo was shot and that's how it is. So it's, it's very different. In fact, vastly different. Colors are different. Tones are different. Lighting's different. And I think the overall mood is different. And she now is a blue eyed person instead. But uh, that's just a quickie, something I'm having a lot of fun with and I'll keep it experimenting. But um, the portrait tools are really fun, really cool. And that's it, Frederick. I will uh, give control back. Awesome, awesome. That's that's fantastic. Thank thank you for sharing that. Um, no and that what a stunning image too. That's that's crazy. <laughs> Got to get my hands on this software. So, 
it's which fine. is a good segue into one of the questions, Rich, as you can see, that's been upvoted to the top of the list there is when's the Luminar beta going to be available for, for people like me that want to get their hands on it? Sure. sure. So um, the beta, there's already the ability to apply to have access to the beta program. That's not... Um, open to everyone, but it is open to apply to everyone, meaning they're adding small groups of people who are willing to give feedback, who also understand that it's still beta, so we don't recommend it for mission critical work. Uh, I've shared that link a few times in the Q&A, and you can find it by just going over to Luminar AI Insiders and, and searching for beta. I'll show that really quick here, and then uh, let me go ahead and uh, also show answer a few of those other questions, Frederick, that you see in there. But uh, yes, you could just please. go over to Luminar AI Insiders and under the home page there, if you just search for uh, beta, so you could just type in beta and you will see that help us innovate the photo editing world. And there's the ability to apply to become part of the closed beta. So that has been posted uh, back on October 23rd. So make sure you are keeping an eye on AI Insiders. We're doing all sorts of releases there. Uh, we had a recent tutorial here from Nicole and lots of other things, plus a bunch of other folks are sharing fun photos. And uh, you can check out the Coffee Break series with Vanilla and Angela each day uh, as they do an edit each day with Luminar AI. So make sure you take a look at that. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, but let me switch back over here. And if there are other questions, uh, one of those was, and I'm actually going to use a photo from you, Nicole, here, uh, about objects or food and, and how we bring some of that to life. So let me just reset this image and jump in. So there are templates for those. And so you will see uh, that there is a category that you can use for macro. And uh, we can go in and it's going to help, you know, tighten up some of the textures, bring out some of that detail. Uh, so you are definitely free to use that. And you can see it just did a really nice, simple edit there. Uh, we can also go really sharp if that's something that you want with Razor. Uh, and that's going to really bring out details. But there's different options here, including those with color grade and the not. I kind of like this one. I'm just going to change the color grade, though. So I'll jump over here to edit. And, uh, you know, remember, you still have a light tool. You still can apply profiles if you're working with raw files. So you still have all of that, curves and everything else but I'm just gonna even that out with accent very quickly and take advantage of structure. Structure makes it simple for me to bring out details. And so you see how it's an intelligent add of the details there. Additionally, you still have details, so you can go after the small, medium, and large details, so you can really bring some of those to life uh, to pop those in the scene. So I like that. I'm just gonna tone down the mood effect here. It was a little stronger than I wanted. And I'll back that off and just get a very simple shift there. So I like the warmth of that there, right about there. And I could refine the color and saturation of that mood so it's easy to use. I don't want film grain in this case, so I'm just going to turn it off. And for those of you wondering where Orton wet, it's right there under glow. It just got combined, so you can still apply that nice warm glow. And that glow can add actual warmth to it. And you can add softness and all those great settings, which is really nice for illuminating things. So it's all in there. And don't forget about professional. The super contrast here is wonderful for going after highlights and shadows. So you can really balance those uh, to get the proper exposure. And this is so much nicer than your traditional shadows and highlights because it lets you really finesse where that recovery is happening there. So you can just get that perfect contrast. So I got great contrast in the highlights and really good contrast there in the shadows. And so I can dial that in and it doesn't wash out the image. It doesn't create a halo. So you have all that and all that stuff is still there. So you can use those AI tools to jumpstart it, use a template to speed things up and then still do that fine tuning as you want. So I was able to remove the distortion there from the lens. So I hope that makes sense. Um, and as you see there, everything still has the ability to use masks. So you could paint the mask, you could do a radial brush or a gradient mask. Uh, there will be other tools coming in under here for copying and pasting and inverting. They're just not on in the beta yet. So uh, I hope that makes sense. Uh, and I can even choose my subject here. So if I want the vignette to draw your eye in there, I can go ahead and remember, put a little light there. Don't just darken the edges. And so now we've got a great smooth transition there 
on that vignette and it pulls your eye right into the very hungry burger for those of you on East Coast time with lunch. So <laughs> thank you, Nicole. You've made me hungry. So this is her photo. So uh, I just, I appreciate that. I'm not a food photographer, but there was a request for seeing uh, some food edits. And like most things, you are going to tend to over edit. So I always suggest coming down here to the master slider. And this is where, you know, you can go ahead and back that off. And if you feel like you over edited it, just take it down to 60% or 70% and gently fade that. And you could take it down and then easily see your before and after or go to your split screen view there. And you can tell what sort of great things you did very quickly. And if you realize that you still need to finesse things, you still have all of those great color controls. So if I wanted to go after the lettuce there, I could change the color of the green on the lettuce just to get it to the perfect green that we wanted. Or maybe the lettuce just needs to be a touch darker. So I can darken that down and target that very specific area. Maybe we want the ketchup just a little bit brighter. And so we can target those areas and make those very fine controls. So AI doesn't mean that you've sacrificed those fine editing tools. It just means that you have to use them a lot less to get results. So um, Frederick, were there any burning questions that uh, you think we should answer today before we wrap up? Uh, I think just one more and then we'll wrap up. And folks, remember you're in the Luminar AI Insiders community, so you're free to post questions in there. It's kind of a direct conduit to to Richard and the, the other team that are behind the uh, the application. But there's one in here that I wanted to have you address, Richard. Um, Curtis wants to know, after I receive Luminar AI, will there, will there be a need for Luminar 4? Do these Do these apps coexist or does one replace the other? Sure. So Luminar 4 and Luminar AI can be installed on the same system. So you are welcome to, to use them simultaneously. Uh, they are designed for different purposes. So Luminar 4 is a traditional editor and uh, it has some AI tools where Luminar AI is intended that you take advantage of templates and there are more AI tools. So AI has been moved to the front, uh, but the two have a different under the hood engine. So the AI tools have been substantially both performance enhanced as well as things like that 3D depth analysis where like tools like Boca AI and uh, Atmosphere AI actually measure the distance in the scene and can use that information when calculating masks and other effects. So uh, there's just differences to them, but they can both coexist. Um, I see a few other questions that are easy. Um, a couple of them I've already right. answered in chat, but I'll answer again. Uh, there is no luminosity masking inside of Luminar AI, but there are additional masking options with that 3D depth mapping that some of the tools use. Um, you pre-order Luminar AI, it was also given a link to download Luminar 4, which I don't have. Um, the two do not upgrade. So uh, if you have any questions about your license, some of you did buy a bundle that included both. You can log in on the website into the support area and uh, you just go to the upper corner of Skyland and log in or you can contact support, but they're separate serial numbers. So don't worry, your Luminar 4 and your Luminar AI number are separate. Um, is someone publishing a book that goes into details on each tool? I'm going to uh, give a plug that Nicole's written two previous books uh, on Luminar, and I suspect she'll probably do another one. Plus, the user manual does go into depth on each tool, so we will always have that. Uh, so check out the user manual, but I also suggest Nicole's books in the past. They're quite well done. I hope that helps. Yes, Thomas, this has been recorded via Zoom, so I think we've answered that. Uh, the system requirements are listed right at the bottom of the web page. The big change there is Windows 10 only. So if Microsoft has officially ended support for Windows 7 and pretty much Windows 8, so have we. Uh, so if you need that, go ahead and check that out. So those are listed at the bottom of the page. Uh, fully integrates with Lightroom, just like Luminar 4 did. So it'll work where you can hand off the original file. Uh, hand off the raw file from Lightroom to Luminar and, and work with it or hand off the edited file from Lightroom to Luminar and then it puts it back into your Lightroom catalog. So no changes on the workflow with Lightroom or Photoshop. Uh, the only change on plugins is that Photoshop Elements support was removed. Um, Luminar AI is using structure to, so with questions on sharpening, um, let me show that really quick, Frederick. Um, no substantial changes on the sharpening front, but a lot of people 
forget that instead of sharpening, you should be using tools like structure. So structure does use uh, what appears to be sharpening by allowing you to improve the contrast of the image. And that's gonna help a lot with details. So let's just reset this image all the way back to base and we'll take the structure up and you can see how that helps with the relative depth. And then with details here, the small, medium and large details are also very intelligent and better than the traditional sharpening. So these allow you to use a targeted adjustment for sharpening that you still can do all of the rest with regular sharpening and masking and all of that stuff like before. Um, but take advantage of structure and details to get that job done. Uh, Denoise, there are advanced settings in there, so you can push it. Um, and so these are here, but it is not an AI based tool, but it is a smart tool, meaning that there's an algorithm in there that does adapt a little bit to the contents to help. Uh, and those work pretty well. And hopefully you can see there how we were able to add a substantial amount of sharpness by taking advantage of structure in details without ever having to touch the traditional sharpening approach that you might've used. So I hope that addresses that. Uh, Frederick, if there's any other burning questions, we could do that. Um, there was a question on HDR. We have a tool that called Aurora. <laughs> you that can send question, right yeah. from Luminar to Aurora. You can send your brackets from Luminar to Aurora and hand them off. So uh, just use Aurora, uh, it works with Luminar. So you can, you can do that handoff if needed. Uh, any work, uh, has, has the team done any work with regard to noise reduction? That was a question. So well. accent and accent helps clean up images and that's part of it. But uh, the, you know, the, the, no the denoise tool has not been changed at this time. So it's similar to what it was before. Uh, still very robust and quite solid. And uh, more importantly, when you use tools like Structure and Accent AI, you don't add more noise. A lot of traditional editing tools like Clarity add a ton of noise to the image, as do shadow and highlight adjustments. And so you don't get those problems. So uh, I'd like to say that you have less noise to begin with when using Luminar, and then you can use Structure and Details to help clean up the things without adding more noise. And then you can use the noise tools that are there. So we do a good job of not adding to the noise. And then you can use the tools that are there to clean up. Love it. Love it. Well, cool. Well, thank you all for doing this webinar. Nicole Young, Jim Nix, uh, Rich Harrington for pulling this together. There's always more to talk about, right? We've got a ton of questions and more pull are coming in. We could easily make this a three-hour uh, event. Uh, but if you do have questions that weren't answered, be sure to make sure you post them in the uh, Luminar AI Insiders community and someone will answer them there. Rich, if that's it for this one, I think we'll close this off and let folks get on with their day and uh, look forward to the next webinar. And I just want to say a big thank you to Jim and Nicole for, for sharing their talent as artists. Uh, you know, it's it's always great. And, and we wanted you guys to see uh, you know, how everyone uses the tool. And so Jim and Nicole both shared their own personal workflows. Hopefully you see that the tool adapts to however you want to work. And so I have my way of working, which is different than Jim and Nicole. And, and that's beautiful because tools should adapt to the user so you can get your job done. Absolutely. All right. Well, great. With that, folks, thank you very much for attending this webinar. We will see you in the next one. Keep an eye on the Luminar AI Insiders events area to uh, keep you posted uh, when the next one is scheduled and we'll see you over there. Take care everybody, have a good, uh, have a good rest of your day.